excuse me, Genesis chapter 6, and um, this is the first class of the uh, study in spiritual realities of Noah, <clears throat> and I mentioned it to those that I was having dinner with tonight, <clears throat> which included some of those people I was just mentioning a second ago, that, uh, that um, this class right here, the one I'm about to teach, is a perfect bridge from the Genesis class that I taught where I finished with Cain and Abel. <clears throat> and this one makes the bridge out of Cain and Abel into Noah. So someday when uh, somebody gets the <clears throat> nerve, they can put all these classes together and we'll actually have a full Genesis course instead of, you know, or a full whatever, because I try to teach full courses and I usually only uh, get part of it done. <clears throat> so, Genesis 6 deals with Noah, and uh, the sixth chapter is uh, the uh, preparation and the, the uh, all that God is <clears throat> saying uh, to Noah concerning uh, mankind and then concerning building an ark. Genesis chapter 7 deals with um, <clears throat> going into the ark and the judgment of the flood. And then Genesis chapter 8 deals with uh, the flood uh, waters going down, <coughs> abating upon the earth, and, uh, and then them coming out into the new world. <coughs> and then uh, Genesis chapter 9 deals with the covenant that God made with Noah. And, um, and also Noah's sin and then a prophecy there. <clears throat> so this is what we're going to be covering. But to really understand Noah and to really draw from the uh, realities that God is trying to set up, it is important to understand the roots from which it came. <clears throat> And those roots were immediately, in this case, immediately in front of the events of Noah. And, that, and they deal with <clears throat> uh, Cain and Abel. And so I want to give you the roots of this, of, of Noah, and of all that Noah means <clears throat> uh, by just hitting a few high points in Cain and Abel's situation. So if you'll turn back to Genesis chapter 4, <clears throat> we will look at this. Now, before I get into that, I'll just draw your attention to what I've written on the board, and that is two things, the line of Cain and the line of Abel. Now, I'll explain this in a minute because you will say there is no line of Abel because that boy died. <laughs> but I will give you the explanation of why I labeled it that in just a minute. <clears throat> All right. Um, and uh, <clears throat> let's begin with verse 1 of Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife, <clears throat> and knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have begotten a man from the Lord. All right, so the first, the first that was born was Cain. <clears throat> okay, Adam and Eve were not born. They were created. But, but Cain was the first who was ever born. <clears throat> then verse 2, and she again bore his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. <clears throat> and so um, you know the story how uh, there came a time to give offerings to the Lord, and Cain gave from the fruit of the ground, the fruit of the dirt. And Abel gave a lamb, a you could say he gave a blood sacrifice, and Cain gave a bloodless sacrifice. <clears throat> All right, so, of course, this is very early in the story, so we already know that, that, that Adam and Eve are, are certainly, you know, Adam understands that he came from the dust of the earth. <clears throat> he came from the dirt of the earth. He's made of that. And you're sort of saying, if you're going to bring forth my fruit to God, if you're going to bring forth Adam to God, and the fruit of Adam 
he's not going to be pleased. But it's going to take a lamb. It's going to take a blood sacrifice. It's going to take it's going to take one who gives his life as a substitute for you. So Abel's sacrifice <coughs> was accepted and Cain's was not. All right. And so from that class in Genesis when I taught on Cain and Abel, I made the point that Cain represents the religious man. <coughs> and really and truly there were meant to be two lines, two lines that came forth and Cain and Abel represent those lines <clears throat> and that is religious man who tries to serve God with his own works what he produces his own thing and trying to please God and working hard and upset when God doesn't accept it and goes why doesn't God accept me I've been working so hard you see why a person would get upset that's why I get upset because I've given everything to God. I've worked hard. I've tithed for years. And now he's not supporting me financially or whatever. <clears throat> Whereas Abel recognizes that there is nothing in myself that is worthy of this. I give you the lamb. I give you the Lord. I give you the cross. I give you Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> and so these two represent the two different lines, and it goes all the way through. I mean, it goes all the way through to, uh, <clears throat> and we'll see this in just a little bit, but, but uh, Jacob and Esau, um, Isaac and Ishmael, always this, and there are always these two lines that run, and they're always in opposition, and they're, they're almost always based on some sort of a religious thing <clears throat> for the line of Cain, and the line of Abel representing the true seed, <clears throat> the seed of Christ, the seed that acknowledges the cross as opposed to the seed that acknowledges its own strength, its own ability, its own what have you. <clears throat> and so, um, however, and again, I said the, the, the line of Abel, but Abel died, and I want to show you in just a minute <clears throat> why I labeled it that, <clears throat> because I believe that these two lines are representative of, like I said, the religious man, but Abel represents Christ. But he doesn't just represent Christ in all aspects and everything, and this is, this is a little key. This will help you when you're searching the scriptures, because uh, now you remember, Jesus in John 5, 39 said, search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. And he said that to people who did not have the New Testament. He said that to people who only had the Old Testament. And we will find out here shortly that in Galatians, that Isaac, uh, that, that Isaac and Ishmael, Abel and Cain, that Isaac and Ishmael represent two separate lines of this thing. Some, by, some people say it represents the Jews and the Arabs. Okay, but it's something way more than that. Yeah, there can be a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth, but the spiritual truth is, and, and we'll delve into this a little more, but we will see that the Lion of Cain, when they stand up for God, they will kill you if they have to. Whereas the Lion of the Lamb will lay down its life for you. <coughs> Amen? And, and let me, you know, let me just clue you to, to that and, and that reality because there are many people, and I'm just going to say this, remember, I'm going to say remember this. There are many people who believe they're standing up for the Lord that go and attack and rip and tear people up and do all sorts of terrible things, and they do it in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said they will kill you thinking they do God's service. The only way they could ever do that is to not understand these two different seeds. And there's basically, you can say there's two basic seeds, Adam and Christ. Okay? There's two basic seeds. You're either of the seed and the lineage of Adam, and that would be your first birth, or you are born again and of the seed of Christ. Amen? And it, it, and it says that, what, uh, that's over in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Um, you know, as in Adam, all die. 
but in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay? And so <clears throat> you can see these, the, the, the Spirit of God will breathe upon the Scriptures and will breathe upon the truth and begin to bring Christ out of there. Like Jesus said, they are they which testify me. Uh, Isaac and Ishmael, Galatians, Paul says in Galatians, that's not talking about Jews and uh, Arabs. I mean, he says that. And I'll even give you another shocker. <clears throat> People say that Ishmael represents the Jews and, and uh, or, or Ishmael represents the Arabs and Isaac represents the Jews. Is that not a common thing? that Anybody ever heard that before? I, I challenge you to just read that chapter and what it says. It says that Ishmael represents Jerusalem, which now is. It represents the earthly Jews, not is, uh, the Arabs. It represents that which is religious, like Cain, but does not have the truth. And Isaac represents the seed, which is Christ. Amen. And Galatians 3.16, and it's, he made his promise, unto Abraham's seed, he saith not un, as unto seeds as of many, but unto thy seed, which seed is Christ. It says it as plain as it can be. So the contrast there is between Christ and everything that's not Christ. Or the seed of Christ, which it goes on to spell out, or that which is religious, may even believe in Jesus as Savior, but is not of the seed. You understand? There's a difference between being a believer, believing things about God, and being of his seed. A seed brings forth a certain kind of fruit. Okay? And I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about Jesus' fruit fruit of his nature, of his way, of his kind. <clears throat> and uh, so, and this was, this was already, you know, I mean, we're not far from, right now we're in four, we're not far from Genesis 1 where, and he made this, uh, this kind of plant or this animal or whatever, and he made every seed after its kind. If it was uh, a cow, then they brought forth seed after its kind. If it was a horse, it brought forth seed after its kind. If it was a skunk, it brought forth seed after its kind. If it's a rice seed, brought forth seed after its kind. If it was an apple seed, brought forth seed after its kind. But in, in the spiritual reality, there's only two kind of seeds, and that is Adam or Christ, Cain or Abel, uh, Ishmael or Isaac, uh, Esau or Jacob, Amen. and on and on and on. So I'm trying to help you to see how the scriptures lay this out and use these things as allegories to open our eyes to, to greater reality. <clears throat> All right. Now, another key, but this is on a spiritual basis, <clears throat> and that is we have in this instance, we have Cain and we have Abel. All right. <clears throat> and we have the result of Cain killing Abel. All right? There's a, there's a, in Cain's heart, there's a murder. Okay? You could say there is murder in his heart. All right. I said that Abel represents Christ. Remember? <clears throat> all right. But not Christ in, in all his facets. He represents Christ as the individual seed or the incarnate seed. Jesus came to the earth and he was the only seed after his kind when he came. There were, everyone else was after the seed of Adam. Amen? Amen? Everyone else was after the seed of Adam. And Jesus made this statement based on the fact that he was the only seed. He said, I'm going to paraphrase and then I'll quote the scripture. He said, I can continue to go around and healing all these bad seeds or casting the devil out of all these bad seeds or teaching these bad seeds, but I'll be the only seed that can truly please God by my nature because my nature is of the same kind as God. So, so, so he said this, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it's going to be the only one. It'll abide alone. But if it die, it will bring forth 
many more after its coming. John 12, 24. Okay? Well, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I mean, that is a beautiful thing. That is, that is a clear apprehension on the part of the Lord that he's the only one, and that's what he called himself. At that time, he was the only begotten son. Amen. But when he rose from the dead, he was called the firstborn among many. Right? You see the difference? <clears throat> All right. So, Abel represents Christ in death, and Seth represents Christ in resurrection. Okay? Um, another example that I think of that's similar to this would be um, David when he had relationships with Bathsheba. And she got pregnant, you remember? She got pregnant, and... <laughs> And then the baby died. And anybody who reads it goes, yeah, that's David's punishment for doing this terrible sin. But you see, God's not trying to communicate terrible punishment. He's trying to communicate his son. He says, search the scriptures. They are they which testify of terrible punishment. No, he said, they are they which testify of me. So that you can get into all these facts and things. But if you miss Jesus, you have missed the true meaning the number one meaning of that. And so that first baby represents what represents the seed in death. And then the next child that comes forth represents him in resurrection. What was his name? Solomon. And all of this glory comes to this seed of Bathsheba. You see. But you see. God's doing greater things than what we think he's doing. There's greater realities going on, and we're usually all caught up in Cain's religion and trying to figure it out based on Cain's religion. Okay? So, um, that, so that's the explanation why I have on the board the line of Cain and the line of Abel. Though Abel died and there was no line from him, there was a line from him. And that line was the resurrection, Seth, and I'll show you that from the scriptures here in a minute. Seth, and Seth, and all that come after him represent the resurrected seed. Not Seth, but Seth as the firstborn among all of that, and everyone after him. So that if you, if you now some of you may have read uh, uh, an article, several articles, about three different ones I wrote fairly recently called... Um, Judging by the wrong tree. Anybody read that? And in there, the, I think it was the second one, <clears throat> I get into this, the way of Cain. And in that thing, I show what's going on with Cain and his way and all this kind of stuff, and I show the progression of his seed. Okay? And so these people right here represent this, represent Adam, because you know Adam was not just the first man that ever lived, and that was it, we're all considered Adam. Amen? Amen? All right. So this is, as it were, the line of Adam or the line of Cain, and all of these are Cain or, or a continuation of that lineage and that line. They're a continuation of Cain. But over here, this is the resurrection, and each one of these represents the body of the fullness of Abel or Christ. And Abel represents Christ in death, and Seth represents the firstborn from the dead. Does that at least make sense? Uh, I didn't say is that right. Maybe I'm totally wrong, but I think I'm on the, on the right track here. And if, you, and if you're wondering, you ain't heard nothing yet, because I'm going to share some things that uh, I'm, I'm sort of amazed at myself. <clears throat> All right. So, keeping your place here, Let's go to uh, Galatians, because I want to just show you a few things there in Galatians, and then we'll come back to Genesis uh, to help solidify this in our minds. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> All right, in Galatians chapter 4, 
verse 22, Paul, he, he writes it like this. He says, for it is written. So what is he talking about when he says it is written? He's quoting the Old Testament. And he's giving you an Old Testament story. Now, I want to tell you that Cain and Abel represent more than, than a story that teaches us that we ought to get along. Okay, And I'm telling you that uh, Isaac and Ishmael represent more than the Jews and the Arabs. And I'm telling you that Noah represents more than look out, God's fixing to wipe you all out. Okay? I'm telling you, and I'm, and I'm using this as just one of many examples. I mean, uh, consider, consider the Jesus that this guy, Paul, saw. He never, never once writes about Jesus of Nazareth. Never mentions a miracle. Never mentions anything Jesus, you know, basically never mentioned. I think I remember when I said that. I think he's, he had quoted Jesus who said it's more blessed to give than receive. But, I mean, when you consider everything Jesus did and said and everything, Paul never quotes Jesus, you know, like that. You would think being alive while Jesus is alive and coming to the, the reality of the Lord shortly after his death, that that's the Jesus he would preach because that's the Jesus we would preach. We would preach the earthly Jesus. But he preached Jesus from Abraham and from Isaac and from the Old Testament and from uh, the Psalms. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because that Jesus has to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. All right. So here he goes again. He's going to preach Jesus to us using Abraham's two sons. Verse 22, for it... For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he, who, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai bearing children for bondage, who is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth, to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which the, is the mother of us all. All right, so basically he's saying this. This story about these two sons are not just stories about how to best raise your children. They're not stories to encourage your faith so that I'm going to be, I'm going, I'm going to believe God for something, or I'm going to, you know, I mean, most people out there that preach the faith of Abraham are preaching how to get money and how to get, you know, cars and all this kind of stuff. That's what they're, that's what they're using their faith for when the faith of Abraham was to bring forth the seed of God by promise through him, which represents Christ in you, the hope of glory, okay? And so, the apostle is declaring unto us not facts and truths and, and relative things at the time or any of that kind of stuff. He's talking about eternal truth that overrides all time and all space, that, that you're either one of two seeds. You're either of the, of the seed of Adam or you're either uh, of the seed of Christ. And in this case, what we've written on the board, that drops down and applies to Cain and Abel. And Cain being the one who pleased God because he gave him the cross. He gave him the Lamb of God. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> so let's see. Let's look in verse uh, 28 and 29. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now I want you to notice... That there is this thing about two seeds, two sons. First, it's just two. Amen? Amen? First, it's just two. Adam, and that's literally the federal head who will eventually bring forth all people after his kind. You can read that over in, what, Genesis 3 or 4. Or that which is Christ by new birth, which will bring forth after his kind. But it begins with two seeds, 
And it ends up the seed being more than just one seed. And that's why Jesus quoted John, or said John 12, 24. If it die, it'll bring forth much fruit. Because the original seed, Abel, laid down his life. And it, the resurrection was Seth. But not just Seth, but Seth being the firstborn of that. And each one after that, and we get, we get the reality of this, that this is the godly line because you've got Enoch who walked with God and was taken. And we've got uh, Noah who walked with God and was the only one in his family was taken through the flood. Whereas over here, you have the way of Cain. And again, if you want to read that thing, uh, I explain the way of Cain and I explain what these people did and it was a continuation of Cain. So, does that sort of make sense? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, that's why verse 28 says, now, now, we, brethren, getting it? He began with one seed, but, but he expands that into the resurrection of Christ, and he says, now we, we're the seed. Now Christ is that seed within us, but we're of the line, we're of the generation of Jesus Christ. Okay? And uh, you see that in, in uh, Matthew 1. It begins. The very first book of the Bible, the very first words, the book of the, the generation, not the generations, the generation of Jesus Christ. That's what that is. That's the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The ongoing seed in one after another after another. One generation throughout all generations, if you understand what I mean. <clears throat> okay. So, let's go back to uh, Genesis 4. Now, what I want to do here in Genesis 4 is I want to show you, number one, how Seth is a continuation of the seed of Abel, or if, as you, if, if you will, the seed of Christ. And I want to show you how Cain continued through these people too, okay, and, and on down, all right? So to do that, let's look in Genesis 4, and uh, let's read verse, um, well, let's, let's read verse 14 to move us into 15. Behold, thou hast, this is, this is Cain complaining to God about the punishment for killing his brother. <clears throat> Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hidden. And I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth, and it shall come to pass that any one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. All right, so God said, God's even merciful to murderers. And, and if you know anything about the way of Cain, he continued in just being off. That God setting a mark on him and saying, whoever does something to you will suffer sevenfold, didn't change his mind one bit. Grace didn't mean anything to him. Didn't mean anything to him. <clears throat> All right. But... Um, uh, verse 16, and Cain went from the presence of the Lord. Well, that's tough. That's a tough one right there, isn't it? <clears throat> and, um, and then verse 17, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his, his son, Enoch. Okay, so we got Cain and then Enoch. Okay, now that's interesting. Because it's not the same Enoch that is over here that walks with God and is taken. You're familiar with that Enoch, right? Yeah. He walked with God and then was taken. It's not the same one. But the names are exactly the same. It's funny that both lines are having, having names either the same or similar, but they're not of the same seed. 
Does that seem a little strange? In other words, you can slap a label on anything. <laughs> right? You know, you, you, you know, you go to a conference and on your name tag you put Jesus and everybody goes, oh, you're a Christian. You know, just because it says Jesus doesn't mean you're a Christian. You know, so, so we're learning something here. We're learning that both lines are very similar outwardly, but they are very different inwardly. They're of a different kind. They are as far as darkness is from light apart, though upon meeting them, you know, you may hear during these early days, you may hear, you know, you may hear what by the time you get to this point in time about Enoch and how he walks with God and what a man of God he is and run into this guy and say, well, you must be it. Because everything came very quickly out of Cain and Abel, if you will, came out of Adam and Eve. That's where the mother of Cain is Eve. The father is Adam. Boy, that's for sure. So, I mean, it's, this is all fresh stuff happening. So you can get confused real easy with all of this. All right. So, um, and then verse 18, And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot uh, Mehujael, and uh, Mehujael begot Mehushiel, and Methushiel begot Lamech. And then verse 19, and Lamech took unto him two wives, and the name of the one was Ada, uh-oh, and the name of the other was Zillah. All right, now drop down with me, if you would, to verse 23. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, boy, if she called on God, you'd call her Godzilla. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> And said this, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man. And I want you to know that the King James here says, uh, To my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. But if you have a different translation, it will read like this. For I have slain a man who wounded me, and a young man for hurting me. That's the actual original Hebrew there. This is what, now he's making this big statement. I have slain a man. Now, does that sound familiar at all? First of all, I have slain a man. Well, who's the last person that slew a man? Well, let's see, that'd be Brother Cain. Does it sound a little boastful here? I have slain a man who wounded me. And I have, what is it, I, I, and a young man for hurting me. You hurt me, I'll kill you. Folks, we're describing the line of Cain right now. We're describing the seed of Adam. We're describing the religious man. All right? Okay. And, and then verse 24, if Cain shall be of, and this is what he says after saying the young man, I, I wounded or killed a man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Okay? So what is he saying? If you, go by, if you go by what was said up here in verse 15, if you mess with Cain, you're going to suffer sevenfold. And Lamech saying, you mess with me, you're going to suffer seventy and sevenfold. Okay? So, let's see, what did I do with my, I don't even have my Mac down here, do I? You got them on Abel's side, in the light. Yeah, we do. All right. Now, the, the very next thing said after that starts with and, A-N-D. Folks, and is a conjunction that connects two things together. Am I right or wrong? You would never use and unless you are connecting two thoughts together. All right. It begins with and. Of all things, Lamech making this prophecy, Lamech saying this statement, and he says, and, Ad, uh, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore 
a son and called his name Seth. There is immediately tied to this prophecy and the immediate coming forth and resurrection of Abel in the person of Seth. And it says, For God said, He hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, or in the place of Abel, whom Cain slew. Can you see it? Look carefully. It's, it's verse 25 at the last of it. And called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead, or in place of, Abel, whom Cain slew. We're talking about the crucified Abel. We're talking about a replacement for the crucified Abel, and that is Seth, the resurrected one, who represents, not just by himself, but he represents the seed. Now, we've seen this in other stories. Uh, uh, Joseph and, you know, him being the, the seed of, um, who is it, Rebecca? Rachel? I, I get Rachel. All right, and, and he's the beloved son, right? He's the special son. He's above all. He's the beloved of the father. Well, who's that sound like? Sounds a little like Jesus to me, but it sounds like the only begotten son. So then what happens? In the process of her bringing forth another son, there's a death. She dies. And another son is brought forth, and his name is Benjamin. And Benjamin represents the multifaceted seed, the resurrected Christ, the many-membered body, the corporate new man. How, you know, there's so many terms you can use for this, but you understand. I mean, it's, it's yeah. this resurre it's Jesus with his many-membered body, Seth, uh, Benjamin, all of these examples opening our eyes to the truth of resurrection and the truth of our union with Christ. And that's the whole point. Um, uh, I, I wrote down uh, Christ in resurrection, Christ in his body, the line of Christ, uh, which is Abel, is continued in us. And here's that line continuing the seed that was crucified but rose again. All right? So it's clear from this scripture that that's what it's talking about. And then verse 26, or the last one in, in chapter 4, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. What's up with that? Do you ever, do you ever just read something and go, Now why did he just say that? Where is that coming from? Well, what he's saying is, there was, there was Abel, and Abel went down in death, to the cross and Seth was the resurrection of that and Seth brought forth and his name was Enosh and, and interestingly enough Enosh means mortal but what it is is this this treasure in earthen vessels this uh, what does it say in the scriptures this mortal shall be swallowed up of life yes you still have a, a, an earthen vessel you still have frailties, but the purpose of that is so that Christ may come out of you. And so, so when Abel died, he was the only seed, the only lineage, the only line that was truly after the Lord, that truly pleased the Lord, that truly gave him the lamb, that truly gave him the cross, that truly honored that. He was the only one who did that. And when, when he was dead, then there was Cain for a long time. Just a lot of Cain. <laughs> you know, you ever heard that saying, uh, where's so-and-so? Well, they're out raising Cain. You know what that means? Resurrecting this guy in your life. That's where that came from. You're raising Cain. We just get it as, well, they're out there causing trouble or whatever. No, they're, they're bringing forth Cain again. It's bringing forth this spirit and this nature and causing trouble. All right. So he's saying that um, there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh, which means mortal. But then he said, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now 
people are mortal, they're weak, they're frail, but they're of this line and they're calling upon the seed and the life of the seed within them, not themselves. And again, this line starts back up and starts on the track with God and this one stays off. Does that make sense? All right. Now, I want to I wanna deal with this... Uh, uh, this prophecy over here, these, these things that uh, Lamech said. Um, well, I guess before I do that, I want to show you the, an interesting thing in Genesis 5. Before I do that, let me just go ahead and, and state a few things here in, in Genesis 4. In verse 23 and 24, he makes this statement. <clears throat> Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man who, wo who wounded me. I, I, he wounded me, but I killed him. And I have slain a young man for hurting me. Clearly, Cain all over again but now in the person of Lamech. And then he makes this statement, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. All right. I believe that every once in a while I run across scriptures that prove that God has a sense of humor. And I believe that every once in a while I run across scriptures that seem to have no explanation and you go to all the writers and they can't tell you, well, I don't know what that is. Or they'll tell you some ridiculous thing that you know in your spirit is the most ridiculous thing and they're trying to cover and they're just too afraid to say, I don't know. Okay? And that's, what, that's the sense that you get sometimes. Maybe you get that when I preach, but that's the sense nonetheless, so you, that'll help you to identify it, you know. Um, but... Here, these statements are followed immediately with the word and, and that and is connecting the birth of Seth to this whole thing, saying that this is not necessarily connected back to verse 15, but something that's coming in the form of Seth. And Seth is the seed of God. Seth is the lineage of God. He is holding the line. And let me just say this right here. Folks, you know, there's just this reality. We're, we're not just Christians. We're, we're not just people that were born and we decided to accept Jesus. And now we have Christian influence. Folks, we're of the lineage and of the seed of Christ. We are a, a I'll say it like this, we are a rare line. Now, I'm not speaking that we are exclusive, are better than everyone else. Everything within myself says, shut up, don't ever say that anybody in this place ever again. First of all, it only, it only causes problems. But, but second of all, I don't believe it. I believe there are plenty. But I do know that God has called us to this line and this lineage and to bring forth the seed of Christ, not just to, not just to preach salvation. And we'll see that with Noah. We'll see the true righteousness. We'll tr see the true salvation. But not just to preach all of that and to do all that, but to, that, that we stand on this earth as just like these guys stood on the earth at their, in their generation. We stand on this earth and we are the ones that hold the line for Christ and him crucified in the earth. I mean, if we don't see that, then you know what we are? We are just people that got born and we decided to get a salvation experience and we're just wandering around and living pretty much for ourselves, but at least we've got some Christian influence. You know, in other words, you know, we go, yeah, well, I won't even give examples, but you know. And, and, and I'm telling you that it's no accident that God has brought you here and that God's saying what he's saying to you, that your life was meant to be the container, the vessel, if you will, the dirt through which the seed comes forth. And that 
that this is a line that we are part of. It continues on. When it says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. Folks, the continuation of that same life, not the same truth, not the head, but the same life within our being is Christ, the risen Christ, the seed that has, by the grace of God, been proliferated on and is still going. You, you want to look back in history and find that? You look back to 100, 200 years ago, the Keswick revival and, and all of that, and, and you see Watchman Nee and Jesse Penn Lewis and, and T. Austin Sparks, and you find people, and, and those aren't the only ones, but those are people who believed as we believed. And you know what? They also helped pass that down to us by giving us books and things that could help spur the reality of Christ. We are the generation for now. Nobody else is. Nobody else can. You can sit back and not do anything and act like you're just another Christian on the planet. But, if you, but you are the only one who can take up that banner because you are the seed. You're, the, you're called to bear the seed. You know? And so what do we do? I mean, what you say, well, we're not doing much. You know, there are people all over the world that know about us, that are fed by us, that are kept by us, and that hopefully we're passing on that seed to that generation in that country. You know? And, and again, that's not speaking special of us. It's our job. It's, our, it's in our nature to, to, to declare this seed because, because we're mortal, and yet we are they that call upon the Lord as life. In the midst of our mortality, it's swallowed up by life. Christ in us, the hope of glory, is the answer. Okay? So, um, Seth was the tenth person from Adam. Yeah, that means there are only ten people in front of him. But his lineage was really, in a certain sense, you could say cut off from Adam. I mean, in a sense, you could say that. Because Abel died, and his father was Adam. And God started a new thing. In a greater sense, you could say that the the flood and the ark represent the cross because it did cut off the line of Cain. It cut off the line of Cain. I mean, if it's only a shadow, so it really didn't cut off all the line of Adam. But in shadow form, the only people that came out of that were of this line. And in spiritual reality, the only ones who come out of it are of this line, which is Christ, which is of Seth. Okay, so... <clears throat> um, him being the tenth from Adam uh, in verse um, where is it verse 18 it says and Methuselah begot Lamech and in verse 23 we see that he was avenged he was avenged by taking vengeance he was avenged by striking down someone, okay? And then verse uh, 24, we see the prophecy about that. And then in verse 25, we find the birth of Seth. Now, in chapter 5, verse 6, it says, And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. All right, now drop down to uh, verse 25 and 26. Let's see. And Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech. So notice again on the board, you have a Lamech in the line of Cain, but you also have a Lamech over here. Okay? And then verse 26, And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech seven hundred and eighty and two years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred and sixty and nine years, and he died. And Lamech lived an hundred and eighty-two years and begot a son. He begot a son. This Lamech brought, brought forth a son. What was his name? And he called, verse 29, and he called his name Noah. All right? 
he called his name Noah. Now we read over here in this prophecy and we think it's all about Cain and all this flesh, but the scriptures testify of Jesus. Am I right or wrong? Right. And then he also says when Noah is born, there's sort of a thing said over him. Uh, verse 29, and he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. What is he saying? He's saying, let me tell you, all the line that we've had, we've had to deal with this earth, this old earth, this cursed earth. But this guy right here, this same Noah, this guy is going to break us free from that because in type and in shadow, he did that. He took the curse off and he brought him into a new creation. Now he was, the, it's funny that this line over here seems to be able to see Jesus and everything. <laughs> but that's what they do. That's why they say these crazy things. And they're just, you know, they're just with it. They're just in tune with what's going on. <clears throat> okay? And then, um, um, so let's, let's go back and let me wrap it up on this prophecy thing. <clears throat> and Lamech said in this verse 23 of chapter 4, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ida and Zil Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man who wounded me and a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. All right, so here's what he's saying in truth, because God's inspiring this. You know, there are plenty of people in the Old Testament that were inspired of God that didn't even know what they were saying. And here's what he's saying. He's not talking about this curse that, that God uh, had put on the original Cain and everything. He's not talking about that. He's talking about another line altogether. God's not talking about the old line. He's talking about the new one. He's not talking about the line of the flesh. He's talking about the line of Christ. He's got his eyes on the truth. And so he says this, and, and, it's, and if... Have you ever noticed that when you see the truth by the Holy Spirit in the scriptures, it's completely different than what you thought it would be? This says, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, folks, the Cain he's talking about is this Cain and his whole line. All of these guys right here, if they're going to avenge themselves by killing Abel, if they're going to avenge themselves by killing a, a, uh, a, a, someone who wounds them and someone who hurt them, and they're going to avenge themselves sevenfold. He says, Lamech, truly, truly, Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. But he's not talking about this Lamech. He's talking about this one, and this one brought forth Noah. And there, through Noah, whatever a vengeance that Lamech's doing over here, through Noah, Noah is the revenge of 70 and sevenfold. Noah is the one who built the ark and took all of them into death. Amen. He totally avenged that line. Lamech was the, was as it were, was the revenge as it were, or the avenging going back all the way to Abel and all the way to the fall of Adam through Cain. And he said, I'll take care of this. He's saying, you know, whatever, whatever you do to us, Abel, by killing him, Amen. whatever you do to avenge by crucifying Christ, whatever you do, sevenfold action against the seed, you haven't seen nothing. Because Lamech, no, not this one, this one, is going to avenge 70 times sevenfold. And he's going to bring forth a judgment and a vengeance on you that will literally wipe your line off the face of the earth and it will be non-existent from that point on. And it was. It was. That's what the flood did. There was no more line of Cain. They all died in the flood. There was no more lineage of Cain. So this prophecy is talking about, so, and, and, and this, so this is where I said, I believe God has a sense of humor. He's sitting there messing with us with this. 
He's sitting there messing with us. He's saying, We're, you're going to get caught up in this Cain thing if you, unless you got eyes to see. You're going to think that it's just talking about what I said I would do for Cain. But I'm not talking about Cain. My eyes are not on Cain. My eyes are on the sun. My eyes are on the, the flood of Noah, the cross, that is going to wipe them out. And then he's saying, unlike us, he's saying, I don't worry about it. You kill Abel, you, you get upset, you strike back, you take things into your own hands, and you avenge what you think is right. You're the avenging angel of God. You may, you know, you may affect, you may afflict us. You know, it's similar to the prophecy of, of the Lord saying, you know, to the, to the serpent, you know, you may bruise their heel, but they're going to crush your head. Amen. You may have sevenfold attack. But when I get done, Noah is going to be my revenge against every ounce of the Lion of Cain. Hallelujah. <laughs> is that incredible? That Noah, I mean, it really, if you look at this too, and I'll, I'll wrap this up now, but if you look at this too, Noah, the prophecy of Noah uh, and of what Lamech would bring forth being Noah did take on the whole lineage of Cain. And through the cross represented by the ark, put them away, dealt with it, cleaned the earth from it, there is no more now. Let me tell you, that's exactly what the cross does. Amen. Sure, there are, there are raids against the seed. And there are ragings against the seed. But we already know what the cross has done. We're not those looking and praying for victory. The victory is done. It's just going to be manifest in your situation eventually. The victory is done. Seth has come. And that's why the next thing following this is, uh, if Cain be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold, and Adam knew his wife and brought forth Seth. And from that, godly line started coming again through this thing. And he said, here comes the Lamech I was talking about. He's going to bring forth Noah. And you better tremble at the thought of that name, Noah. Cain, you better tremble because you will be extinct in his lifetime. You will be extinct. I will not f smite you sevenfold. I will smite you, and it's called the cross, 70 times sevenfold and wipe you out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, well, I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. Kelly, this wasn't on. <laughs>